Well, I'd imagine if you were to survey a number of young people who had no association with church or Christianity, and you were to ask them about their concerns about the Bible, one of their chief concerns would probably be on the Bible's teaching of sex. They would say it's totally out of touch with reality. They would say at best it's outdated, perhaps even at worst it might be deemed dangerous. And if you were with us in Read Daily the past couple of days, we've been looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And what we've really discovered as we think about the Bible's view on sex, that God's rules are not random, they're not restrictive. God cares about what we do with our bodies because God cares deeply about us. And in chapter 7, we're going to continue looking at what Paul says about sex, particularly in the context of marriage. And what we discover is that Paul and the Lord are not against sex. God is actually very for it. He created it. It's his gift. Rather, what he teaches us in this chapter is that it's to be enjoyed in a very specific context. And so let's see two things in 1 Corinthians 7 verses 1 to 5. Firstly, sex is a gift to be enjoyed. And secondly, sex is a gift to be shared. Notice firstly, sex is a gift to be enjoyed. Look at verse 1. It says, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. You might recall as we've been working through 1 Corinthians, we've discovered that this letter from Paul to the Corinthians isn't actually the first letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to them. In fact, it's probably the second. Prior to this, Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthians and they responded. And so this letter, 1 Corinthians, is Paul's response to the letter that the Corinthians wrote back to him. And so throughout 1 Corinthians, you'll see a number of occasions where the Apostle Paul deals with something that the Corinthians said in their earlier letter. And this is one of those examples. In verse 1, notice the quotation. This is something that the Corinthians said to Paul in their letter to him. They said this, It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. It appears that some of the Corinthians were totally against sex. They thought it was evil. They thought it should be totally abolished and abandoned. Now, having read chapter 6, that might come as a surprise. Because in chapter 6, we discovered that the Corinthian culture was extremely sexually liberal. They were just giving their bodies away to anyone who wanted them. They were so sexually liberal. The problem with the Corinthians wasn't that they were having too little sex. The problem was the polar opposite. They were having far too much sex. But it appears that in light of that very liberal sexual culture in Corinth, a number of Christians went to the total other extreme. They went to the total other extreme to the point where they would say, sex is evil, sex is terrible, it should be abolished, and it should be abstained from under every circumstance. It doesn't matter if you're married or not. And how does the Apostle Paul respond? Well, look at verse 2. He says, But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The Apostle Paul says, No, 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 that's not true either. Sex is not evil. Sex is not the ultimate enemy. Sin is the ultimate enemy. Sin is the ultimate problem. The sin which exists in our human hearts is the real enemy here. Sex is not the enemy. It's a gift from God. It's something to be enjoyed. The problem is our sinful hearts which have warped and, and taken away that, that good gift from God and warped it for our own evil desires. And so what does Paul say? He says sex is something which should be enjoyed by a husband and a wife in the covenant of marriage. That's why when Paul says here in verse 2, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. The word have there is a reference to union, sexual union. Each husband and wife should come together in sexual union. In other words, Paul says, sex is not the enemy. It's a gift to be enjoyed in the covenant of marriage. He says really the same thing if you skip your eye down to verse 5. He says, do not deprive one another speaking to husbands and wives, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Paul says here, sex isn't just something which can be enjoyed within the context of marriage. Rather, sex is something which should be enjoyed within the context of marriage. It's a gift from God which should be enjoyed by married couples. In fact, he says the only real valid excuse not to engage in sexual relations as a husband and wife is if you're dedicating a season to focus direct prayer. But even then, the Apostle Paul says, make that time short so that you can come together once again in sexual union. And so the first message that the Apostle Paul teaches about sex here is very clear, isn't it? Sex is a gift to be enjoyed. But secondly, notice that sex isn't just a gift to be enjoyed within the marriage covenant. It's also a gift to be shared. 
a gift to be shared. The Me Too movement is one which really exploded in 2017 and became a global phenomenon. It really arose out of a number of allegations made by actresses in Hollywood who made fresh allegations against a number of very powerful men in Hollywood who were abusing their power to exploit vulnerable women and engage in sexual misconduct. And in light of that, the phrase Me Too really became the rallying cry of a generation against the abuse of power, particularly from men, and sexual misconduct. See, even our society recognises that sex is not merely a commodity which can be exchanged just like that. No, it's precious. That's why our culture has placed such an emphasis on things like consent. We realise that human beings are precious and that the act of sex is to some degree sacred. That's why we rightly are against, as a society, things like rape and sexual misconduct. And you know, even our culture, if we were to look into the Corinthian culture to whom Paul is writing, even our secular culture would probably be totally, totally horrified. Because this culture in Corinth to whom Paul is writing, they were perhaps even more sexually liberal than our culture. There was no equality. There were no rights for women. In fact, the opposite was true. Corinthian men had total rights over women. They were often oppressive. They were allowed to have numerous mistresses and whenever men wanted to sleep with their mistresses, they were entitled to it. Women had zero rights. And it's against this backdrop that the Apostle Paul writes verses three to four. Look at them with me. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. You see, as you read verse 3 and 4, those two verses would be shocking to the first hearers in Corinth. And probably half of what Paul says in those two verses, the first hearers in Corinth would absolutely agree with. In fact, they would say, Amen, Amen, Amen. They absolutely agree that a wife should get a, give a husband his conjugal rights. They would absolutely believe that a woman does not have authority over her body, but her husband does. They would say, we are in full agreement with that. But what would shock them most is that Paul doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say a wife should give her husband his conjugal rights, but he also says, likewise, a husband should give his wife her conjugal rights. He doesn't just say that a wife doesn't have total authority over her body, her husband does, but he also says that a husband doesn't have total authority over his body, his wife does. And so what's most shocking about Paul's statements here? It's the equality with which he sets the framework of sexual intercourse in the context of marriage. He says men and women are equal partners. Sex is not something which should be exploited. It's not something which you can take from someone else. No, it's a gift to be enjoyed together. It's a shared enjoyment. There's a mutuality here. And that runs totally against the grain of the Corinthian culture where men were seen as superior and they had a right that women did not possess. Do you know in our society we preach for consent, we preach for equality even in the context of sex. And so is the Bible's view on sex outdated? No. In fact, our society today, in many senses, is pushing for a message or an ideology that the Bible's been preaching for hundreds and hundreds of years, that of equality. Is the Bible's message on sex outdated? No. But it is countercultural, and it is good. Here's your challenge today. Where do you see in our society its view of sex being different to that of the scriptures? And how does the scripture's portrayal of what sex should be and was created for, how is that really a better story to that which our society preaches today? Hope you have a good day.